anyone doing at least seven figure, anyone that has seven figures, still definitely do have their own fulfillment setup in China because like the the cost savings, the the processing speed, the, the ability to scale. I mean, not all suppliers can scale like five or six thousand like orders per day. You know, given like, and not necessarily like you're gonna get all the suppliers to be able to have stock. So usually. There's a point of time whereby we buy out the entire China market's supply, so it's like we're scaling so aggressively that like you know everyone's out of stock, and like we have an agreement that only they can sell it to us. So like any any copycats who try to like you know get into the game and try to sell the same product, they don't even have inventory. So eventually they're just gonna like refund all the customers and pay for all like you know take the loss for all the ad spend. So like、um, that's a unique advantage that we do have. Sometimes you know, depending on how hard we scale, and how new the product is, if the product is really mature, super a lot of like sellers and manufacturers, then it's probably harder. But、um, you know, if it's a new product, probably only like five or six、um, big manufacturers we can easily usually buy out there. And welcome to iStack Trainings podcast, the robust marketer. I am super lucky to be here today with Steve Tan. Now, many of you will be familiar with Steve Tan and his brother Evan Tan,、uh, and some of their amazing exploits that they have been putting together in the e-commerce space. My first exposure to Steve was a post that he made on Tim Bird's Facebook Buyers Group, where he showed screenshots of his first four hundred thousand dollar day. Uh, that's a big day by anyone's standards, and、uh, I was just absolutely blown away. I, I, I instantly started digging in and, and researching about who these guys were and what kind of numbers they're doing. So I was, I'm very glad to finally get him on the show. I'm sure, as he's told me, that's just one of his stores. He's got several other ones going on,、uh, and he's here to talk a little bit with our audience about、uh, his e-commerce success. Welcome to the Robust Marketer. How you doing, Steve? Hi Eric, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on like your podcast today. Appreciate it. Yeah, man, excellent. So the first thing that I like to do on my podcast is、uh, the guest tells a little bit about their marketer's hero's journey. So what brought you from starting out? How long have you been doing this? And and sort of what are some of the key steps along the way that brought you to to where you are today? I think、um, I mean mindset is very critical for me. Like, but、uh, I've started back in two thousand six. You know, selling physical products, not on e-commerce stores. But on eBay, so probably that's the, my first step, like in how I got started with selling physical products, and like you know, it scaled to a point whereby I'm doing probably forty, fifty k per month, and I felt that it's really hard to scale further more. So I kind of like started to look for solutions whereby I could,、um, you know, have everything on my own store rather like on a platform whereby I can't control. Like my sales funnels, I can control. I can get all. I can get my email address from all the customers. I can do follow up everything, right? So eventually, we ventured into doing our own、uh, e-commerce stores. So started with a blog, kind of like you know, like the old before WordPress, right? So we dabbled with like HTML pages. Then luckily, eventually, Magento came out, but it's like a really, really heavy solution. Probably back in '07, we started exploring、um, Magento '07, '08, but things really picked up for us、um, mid mid of、uh, '08 to '09, whereby we started scaling probably around three to four hundred k per month. At peak was about、uh, the peak was five hundred k. We we can't like you know go through five hundred k. You know anything more than that is like unachievable for us. But it's pretty consistent. The ROI is just crazy back then because like there's literally not much people using Facebook. You know, if you're spending, we're spending about one to two hundred k per month with Facebook back then. So like you're super big baller when you're spending hundred k back then. They'll treat you like king. They'll give you all the API access. They'll give you a lot. But but it's so much easier right now because there's so There's pixels. Facebook has evolved so much, like made it so easy for all these advertisers, which is why I'm like sharing a lot with all my friends and people who's getting interested in e-commerce because there's no better time to get started because like you guys have Shopify right now, you can get set up like a store in just literally a few minutes. 
or even for a newbie, is like 10, 20 minutes or just like a few hours, right? Facebook ads, you know, probably just takes you like, you know, a few weeks just to really get good at it, you know, familiarize yourself, and it's all about testing. You know, back in the days, we don't even have pixels. You have to use like custom codes, custom third-party tracking, you know, there's no, like all this convenient stuff ever, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it is, you've obviously come a long way. So you, you first started hitting your big success in 2007, 2008, you were saying? Yeah, and, 2008, and 2009. 2008, yeah. 2009. And then since then, what's it been like? Like what has, what allowed you to get over, did it peak then or has it continued to go up? And then what do you attribute like being able to get over that, that next hump? So it kind of like peaked during then. Then we did some different startups. You know, we did some crowdfunding. We did some startups, um, tech startups, consumer electronics. It did pretty well. We did a few million in some of the top startups that we did. You know, things go up and down. Met some bad partners. You know, got cheated in a lot of business. So the, at a point of time, it's like we're still pretty young. You know, young and naive probably. So you, you're gonna meet a lot of people that's gonna like peach you because you're successful in a way that they want you to invest your time and money, right? So like it kind of brought us down to, to a point whereby we lost a lot of all the money that we you know, kind of earned during our young days. So it's pretty much up and down till all the way that I'm kind of like so sick of it. So, you know, just like I even got into Forex just for like, you know, a few months just to see, uh, you know, because the mind during at the point of time where everything cra uh, crashes, right, you kind of get into a really bad mindset whereby you want to try to salvage whatever you can, like just to get reach again quickly, right? But, you know, chances that you know that uh, when you get into such a bad mindset and you want to get rich quick, you know, you, you'll just try something that that's not like, you know, stable, that's really high risk. So I got into Forex for a few months, borrowed 20K, blew it in just a few few weeks. And like I figured out, you know, it's it's not something I really want. Uh, so one of my really good friends just said, why not just go back into e-commerce since you guys are just like good at it, right? So it came, kind of gave me a wake up call. Like after we had like a 24 hour chat, you know, it, it, this guy is really my, my good friend. He gave me a wake up call. So I went crazy and like I just thought like I really need to get up to speed with what's changed and everything. And like for us to just go back and do drop shipping, it's so easy compared to all the startups that I've been doing. It's like a no brainer. Like the amount of effort and energy required to do a startup and compared to a drop shipping or a Shopify store is like probably just one or two percent of what's like doing a startup. So, yeah, I mean, we scaled really, really aggressively, really quickly. Even in the first month, we did like high six figures and we continued to do like seven figures the next month and we scaled more. So since then, we did multi multiple eight figures already since then. Unbelievable. And you're gearing up for your biggest Christmas ever, I would imagine. Yeah. So this year, we're going to make sure we crush hard on Christmas and like we're so at this point of time, our Philippines team is 100 percent virtual. But, um, you know, I have a lot of offices in Philippines before, but obviously because of like the startups close and open, right? You have to open your startup, close your startup. I've been through, like, I'm kind of like jaded in a way that I don't really want to have like physical office. And I've spoken to a lot of good friends, like gurus that told me, you know, just keep it, you know, keep it virtual. But I think I came to a point of time that I really want to start a new office again in Philippines like you know I like the vibe the startup vibe you know the kind of like Facebook style Google style kind of office so we're gonna buy it probably buy a big office next next month next year in Philippines and have everyone just like work from the office then kind of like a hybrid you know physical and virtual kind of like um, setup cool we have a team in Manila um, and they're just amazing and they I haven't visited them there yet but I think that I just saw today is a team of 30 uh, that, that iStack has in Manila. And there's this, the, the, apparently the sense of camaraderie uh, in, in the Philippines, in, you know, in, in this office is just unbelievable. And people like they've made it a great place to hang out. So people are sleeping there and like, <laughs> like it, it, you know, they they play a, like a weekly poker game, like the whole, like they have this big poker tournament all the time. And like just the way that, that yeah, that things have kind of come together there. I think I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think I think you might see some some benefits from having that. That being said, the the remote office thing is is absolutely wonderful. I split my time about 
uh, two days a week at home and, and maybe two, and three days in the office. And I really enjoy having that balance. For me personally, it helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds good, man. So like uh, we used to have like a team of 50 people in the Philippines, like um, in, also in Manila. So we're in the Otigas area. So it's really nice that like they are such like um, they, they work really closely with their coworkers. You know, it's like in Asia, like, you know, especially probably in China or, or in like Singapore, people don't hang out with colleagues on the weekends. Like, but in Philippines, they kind of like they'll go out for movies, they go out for like bowling. I mean, like the vibe is just like really strong. Like they do like become really good friends. They mm-hmm. do hang out during the weekends with the family, so and so forth. So the culture is like, uh, it, it's also depending on the company culture, obviously, but um I think these are people that, you know, if you treat them really nice, you know, you get rewarded like 10x your investments. Yeah. In my experience, uh, I'm a pretty nice guy anyway, but uh, their work, <laughs> the, the quality of their work is just astounding, the design, the development. So you're using design, development. Do you also have a lot of like um, customer service uh, reps in the Philippines as well? Yeah, mainly everyone, all the customer support are from the Philippines yeah, because they speak really good English. The rates are reasonable. So I've been telling a lot of my friends, please don't spoil the market rates because like, you know, it used to be like two, three hundred US, but right now probably of the surge of demand for customer support reps, you know, these guys are like just going crazy. Like on Upwork, they're charging like crazy rates, like five, six hundred, seven to eight hundred. So it might seem cheap in the US or in like Europe, right? But like literally everyone is spoiling the market rate because they think it's still cheap whereby it can be cheaper but it, i'm not saying that we should underpay all these people but you know um, you only sh- you should only reward those that are really ex- exceptional and good and up to par and not like just across the board everyone gets the good rate you know everyone gets like super high pay you know it just spoils the market for a lot of people yeah sometimes yeah i can imagine so so you're now operating at this super high scale. What what are some of the tools? Have you had to build out at the scale that you're out when it comes to fulfillment and customer service? Have you had to build out uh, like your own software tools at all? Or have you been relying on, on external tools? And if so, what are some of the tools that have really made a big difference for you guys that have allowed you to scale to the heights you have? I think uh, we do use some tools. It's like local, um, custom made. You know, it's for more for logistics because like you have to integrate with the, you know, your warehouse WMS tools, whereby it takes care of all your logistics, your warehouse management. We do have like an experienced manager in place for that, so he takes care of all the, you know, the setting up, you know, the integration and everything for that. So other than that, you know, we don't use a lot of Shopify apps. Um, mainly because of like you know if sometimes you use too much it's gonna slow down your store some there's some apps that's not really ethical that steals your data you know but um, overall we just use minimal apps on our stores a lot of things that we do are actually integrated directly into the store so in a way that um, you know we do some uh, custom built apps, you know, mainly for our logistics. But the rest would be, you know, just uh, I think most of the people are using like custom, uh, probably like currency conversion, mm-hmm. Wheelio. Um, we do some of the we don't we used to, but we stopped using um, urgency apps, like those countdown timers. We stopped using that so. Yeah, we don't. We really don't use much of the apps right now. So the scale, the scaling would majority come from like Facebook ads. We diversify a lot of our traffics. Uh, we do a lot of SEO. So SEO accounts to like probably 10, 20 percent. It's incredible. Of our yeah, 10 to 20 percent. Given the, our volume, it's still good money. We do, we do. Uh, we don't do native ads for now. But um, after talking with James, you know, probably like. We would be interested to test it out too, but um, Google, Google AdWords, GDN, Google Search, um, you know SEO, Facebook. Facebook is still the majority because like it's so uh, so much easier to scale with Facebook compared to any other traffic source. Yeah, I th- I think it's when they like what you're doing, you you know you you can really put the pedal to the floor, and yeah now. 
when you, you know you're scaling to these to these incredible heights here are you are you running in like are you running into policy often do you have like a very a strong relationship with the policy team there you obviously have a rep you're obviously treated they were mm-hmm. treating you like a king early on um no <laughs> not now <laughs> no <laughs> it's it's now it's a it's a struggle uh, I mean, like, we do have good relationships with Facebook, obviously, given the span we're doing. So, like, you know, they do advise us on, like, what kind of creatives we should avoid. You know, they obviously can't, like, tell you off the bat for every single creative you upload. But if there's problems, they'll work with us to get it resolved instead of, like, just shutting you down for no reason. If, you're, if your ad got removed, there's a, usually a good reason why, like, uh, what happened. So you're you know what exactly happened instead of being in the dark. Interesting. So so let's just talk logistics a little bit about the kind of scale you're working with. So you're, we, we talk to people that want to get into dropshipping. Most often, the easiest thing for them is to go and uh, get Oberlo and get Shopify and just flip things from China. Um, that is that how you is that how you started? Yes, when we just got started, we don't, I mean, when we got started, the unique advantage is being like, we have been in China for like more than 10 years, right? So we have like, um, we're so familiar of where to do all the procurement, all the purchasing. So off the bat, we didn't even use AliExpress because like, um, it's kind of like for, for beginners because it's more expensive. So we usually just source from locals, local websites, like, you know, um, um, Taobao or 1688, you know, there's a lot of different sources that we go to, but, uh, you know, being able to speak the local language and being have, having a team there in China does help a lot that sorts out all this. So basically, um, we didn't, like, we can't consider ourselves as dropshipping because, like, we do hold a lot of inventory, multiple, multiple six figures of inventory in our warehouse. Like, I'm not sure if you have seen the video, like, we have, like, a big warehouse in China that does all our logistics. So... Yeah, you could check it out. I shot a video, a quick video on yeah, it. Well. So it's like uh, I took, I showed everyone in the group like a tour of my warehouse in China. So basically, it takes care of all our fulfillment and logistics, pick, pack, ship. Everything's done there. So once our procurement team done um, does the purchase, everything gets shipped to the warehouse. So when everything everything is like labeled properly, so every time when they pick, pack, ship. Everything scanned, everything goes through the system, so it's very systematic. I don't exactly know like the super needy greedy deals uh, of every every single step because like you have to hire professionals to do that for you. I mean, yeah. it's not like the CEO's job to you know know every single shit that happens in the company. But um, definitely, definitely do only consider like having your own warehouse, logistics, everything. When probably doing like at least high, you know, five to six hundred k per month then probably consider because anything below that I don't think it's really necessary at this point of time. So, uh, I mean, you can easily get sourcing agents or like, you know, people or even your sellers could do that for you. Like, you know, AliExpress sellers, you know, if once you have a good relationship with them, they're usually more than happy to source other single products for you because like they get to um, earn money from that. So I have a few good friends doing like, you know, um, high six figures and they only rely on like their AliExpress sellers, which they came to develop a relationship in a way that they could help them become their sourcing agent. They could cut out Ali, AliExpress essentially, but the relationship was forged through Ali? Yeah, so they are forged through Ali, you know, like kind of like they established kind of like the trust and everything in there. Then they, they'll say, okay, I could, help you, I could help you source this product. So in a way, like, you know, when you started selling more, you, you approach him, hey, do you have this product? They will just tell you, okay, I could source this for you because it's so easy for locals just to like, you know, just type it in, get some samples, you know, it's, it's just it's just so easy for locals to, to do it because they speak the, the native language there. So step one, speak Mandarin <laughs> or have a partner that speaks, that speaks it. I think, I think um, you know, just getting started, don't worry too much about it. Yeah. You know, just uh, start off with AliExpress, you know, get everything set up properly, get to know your, your suppliers, get to 